Welcome to Auto Complete. This is Roadshow's weekly news podcast about the intersection of cars and technology. I'm Brian Cooley, editor at large with Tim Stevens, Roadshow editor in chief, and about one third of a voice. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, I'm I'm on the tail end of a, a bit of a bad cold, so my voice doesn't quite come back. But it's good to be here in person with you, Brian. We've been uh, going our separate ways for yeah. a while since Detroit, so it's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to be in person with Mr. Stevens, and let's get right into it now and take a look at what's going on around cars and technology. Uh, this is one of the most overreaching, uh, overarching, I should say, not overreaching stories that we have this week, which is uh, all of a sudden the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is a huge division of the Department of Transportation in the U.S. This is big stuff. Uh, is open to the idea that a car without a driver is the driver. Uh, in a letter, rather lengthy, uh, that's been reported on that they sent to Google as part of an ongoing dialogue about how future self-driving cars will be regulated. NHTSA has a whole bunch of language saying, "Okay, we're ready to move toward the idea." of seeing the technology in the car as the driver for regulatory and and legal purposes. This is a kind of a big one. It, it, it is. Basically, what, what this is, it's a response from a, a letter from Google to NHTSA basically saying that uh, these are the things that we have issues with or that we have concerns about legislation that's on the books right now that we're not sure that we comply with, but that we need to either be changed or we need some clarification from you on whether or not our cars are, are legal, basically, for these things. Yeah. Things like... Um, there are laws that, that dictate minimum sight lines from drivers, laws that dictate warning lights that need to be shown to the driver. But if the car doesn't have a driver, then do you need a warning light on the dashboard, things yeah, like you, that. If you don't have an idiot, you don't need idiot lights. Exactly, exactly. So uh, basically what this letter is, is basically a 10-page response from NHTSA back to Google saying, here's your big list of concerns and here's our response to them. And the majority of them are amazingly mm-hmm. warm and open to saying, yes, absolutely. You know, we have legislation on the books right now that says that the accelerator pedal needs to respond for a given rate. But, you know, ultimately we'll need to change that because there may not be an accelerator pedal in the car. Uh, so it's kind of shockingly open and transparent yeah. and ultimately very welcoming to the idea of these cars that need to be need to be driverless and what, what needs to change. So basically, you can look at this as a big, long bullet list of all the things that the government needs to change mm-hmm. in order to make these cars legal. But the, the majority of those things where the law is not accurate with what Google needs, there are notes basically saying that Google can file for an exemption and continue testing to do what they're doing. Basically, the government saying, we don't want to slow you down, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, and this is following on the heels of uh, initiatives we heard at the very end and the top of 2016, very end of 2015, how uh, the DOT says, look, we want to really get out of the way here and also uh, move parallel to this and get some regulations moving later this year on how to deal with cybersecurity in connected and eventually self-driving cars. So that's another avenue where they want to make sure that they're not holding things back. And as Tim mentions, a lot of this has to do with old laws that are on the books saying you've got to have a brake pedal, for example. Well, you don't need that on a self-driving car in a true, full self-driving fashion. I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea that you know Google's latest prototype car gets rid of the human controls. And I've always wondered, is that really a plan or is that more of a test bed to see how would people react when you take away the opportunity to think of yourself as the driver? It's definitely a very interesting move and a very progressive sort of thing. It's the kind of thing that I think most of us think that you won't really see on a road for quite a while. Yeah, well, that's like 2050 at exactly. earliest, right? At, at least outside of these major urban areas. Uh, so, you know, it, it remains to be seen, but it is, again, good to see that, that this is being progressive, that the government's trying to be progressive here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and lo- looking at things like, I made a note of a couple of them, the, the warning lights we talked about, um, there has to be a noise made when the d- driver's side door is open and the car is able to be moved, uh, but which is the driver's side door if there is no driver in the car? And do <laughs> you need that noise yeah. either? Um, and again, the line of sights had to be available for a 95 percentile human being, effectively. They need to be able to see out of the car. Uh, and again, it doesn't really matter that much. So th- yeah. there's basically 10 pages worth of these exemptions and things that Google needs to file for, which sounds like their their paperwork jockeys are going to be having a good couple weeks to get all those things filed. <laughs> but again, it, it is encouraging that ultimately they can get those exemptions and that the government is actively trying to, to move forward on these things. Yeah, so the warmth of the response from the U.S. government is really the big thing to take away from this. It's definitely our sort of our biggest trend story of the week. I mean, this is this is showing that we're really making some progress, at least in attitudes, mm-hmm. uh, with the specifics to come. Now to go on to our most ongoing story, the latest on the VW Group's Dieselgate. We told you in last week's show that VW had come back with their second attempt to get the two-liter diesels, that's the majority of the problem engines, dealt with in America with a new plan to fix them to the EPA and to the California Air Resources Board, and they have 
have yet to get a reply to that one. The last one that they did, the first attempt, was absolutely slammed by the regulators. Now, on top of that two-liter plan, they've just submitted a three-liter plan, which is a smaller number of vehicles. Uh, that's going out to EPA and CARB as well. So we're just waiting to see more uh, sort of follow-on on that. Then uh, this interesting angle came along uh, dealing with Fiat. And we hadn't heard that Fiat Chrysler had any issues, but a German uh, advocacy group uh, with the unfortunate uh, acronym of DUH, or DUH, <laughs> <laughs> sure, it doesn't mean that in German, but um, they say that the Fiat 500 in diesel trim, which we don't get in the U.S., um, is also a vast overpolluter, 11 to 22x in some driving scenarios that they've verified, which they say to them can only occur with a defeat mechanism. And this group has also called up Mercedes-Benz and other manufacturers as yes. well for supposed infractions. But ultimately, this is not an official government group. Ultimately, there needs to be further testing to verify these claims. So, you know, don't don't go selling your Fiat 500X. Although, yeah. if you're in the U.S., you can't have this car anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But it, it certainly does, I think, point back to the concern that I think a lot of us had that ultimately Volkswagen was the first to get caught, but certainly not the only one who is who's trying to kind of fudge the numbers a, a little bit yeah. on this sort of thing. So I hope that this... I mean, I hope that this isn't as bad for Fiat as uh, as it has been for Volkswagen. Fiat is not having the best of time right now, as we've seen with the delays in the U.S. for launches of some of their cars and things like that. Um, but ultimately, you know, I guess we'll have to wait and see on this. As far as the three-liter diesel change goes, my understanding of that is that it's a very different sort of uh, issue than we've seen in the smaller diesel engines, where this is basically a case where the engine is actually having too much emissions up front when the engine is warming up, or basically they were trying to overheat right. the engine to get it to warm up more quickly. That would then result in better emissions in, in in the long run, the idea being that the the engine is largely compliant. It's just when it's warming up that it is basically using oh, too much fuel. Okay. That's so my understanding of this. Of so it, it's a very different sort of thing, which would, in theory, be an, an easier fix. We probably just need to make a software tweak to get rid of that warm up phase. Um, but again, we haven't seen the full details of exactly what Volkswagen wants to do, and we'll have to wait to see what the EPA says uh, yeah. as far as this fix goes. So on both these proposals for two and three liter Volkswagen family engines, I know a lot of you are waiting. What's going to happen to my mm -hmm. car? What are they going to do? We do not know what's in the black box yet. What the proposal was and even the replies that come back from epa and carb so far have not specifically said what was wrong with the initial uh proposal that they've knocked down certainly in the two liter case so it's just this black box being moved back and forth between applicant and regulator as soon as we know more about that uh we will of course let you know now um don't have a lot of details on this one, but coming up at Mobile World Congress, which is the biggest mobile technology and cell phone show in the world, Trump's even consumer electronics show, Ford has given us just this teaser that they will have a new vehicle they'll launch at Mobile World Congress, another sh uh, indication that tech shows are becoming the most interesting auto shows, and they will also unveil a new advanced in-car technology. Any speculation what they might be talking about with this advanced in-car technology? Uh, I don't know at, at this point. No, I mean, we're certainly expecting an update to their smart mobility program, which is the thing that Mark Fields talks about every single time he gets yeah. behind a microphone, which has everything to, to you know, from <laughs> uh, smart parking to tolls to um, emissions to car sharing and everything else. So we'll yeah. hear a lot about that. But beyond that, no, honestly, I, I don't know exactly what we should expect coming out of there. Um, but... MWC hasn't really established itself in the way that CES has from an automotive standpoint, but we have seen advancements there. Ford was showing off an electric Focus a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. There were a few other cars at Ford. Ford usually rolls out something at MWC, but we haven't seen the other manufacturers diving on there, largely because Geneva yeah. is so close thereafter. And oftentimes, MWC and Geneva are at the same time, even. Um, right now, that balance is, is, is being a little bit more healthy, perhaps, than the CES Detroit balance. We'll have to see how that goes forward. Uh, but no, I don't know what to expect from Ford exa exactly, but we should also expect some other uh, car stuff from other electric companies that I, I can't really talk about. And a lot of what yet. comes out at MWC <laughs> is also from, let's say, wireless carriers mm -hmm. who have new uh, services that work with cars or a new OBD2 dongle service, which are becoming, you know, just those are a commodity now. Right, but a lot of those get announced. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of folks who have automotive-specific apps that work on mobile. So a lot of vectors there will be keeping an eye on. Of course, we have a large CNET team going to Mobile World Congress just about the same time. We have a large roadshow team going to the Geneva Motor Show. Those are uh, basically back-to-back. -back. Yeah, uh, be We'll be on shows. top of both. Uh, Kia is not a company you think of going after German performance cars, uh, even though they've got, uh, have had for a few years now, Peter Schreier from a uh, former Audi guy mm -hmm. doing their design and now kind of heading up the whole division. But uh, there's a Reuters story, not a place we normally expect to find breaking car news, but that uh, sort of global general world news service says that uh, there may be a sort of a three series sounding car performance, Cooper sedan, mm -hmm. rear wheel drive. Mm -hmm. 
coming from Kia? You think the brand can support it, or do people that buy that kind of car say, "Nope, I want German because I want German"? Well, I, I, I think they do, but ultimately, we saw Hyundai throw the Genesis Coupe out there, much the same sort of concept, anyway, a sporty rear-wheel drive uh, coupe. Uh, this will be a little bit of a different thing. It sounds like it's going to be much a bit more of a luxury car, luxury performance car. Um, mm-hmm. But Hyundai's been making great. You know, great progress in that grand, especially with their launching of the Genesis brand, which ultimately sprang off from yeah. the Genesis Coupe from a while back. Um, and this sounds like it's Kia basically taking that first step into that um, into that new, brave new world. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a shaky step, probably. There'll be a lot of uh, a lot of dissent, and certainly a lot of folks saying, "I would never pay extra for a Kia luxury car." But ultimately, yeah, sort of carism, if you will, right? But uh, <laughs> I mean, people said the same thing about Lexus. You know, we'll have a decade, more than a decade ago, but um, Lexus and all these other premium brands that have come out of the, these lower cost manufacturers. And you know, I think it's time. Kia's been making great cars. Have been doing a lot of great stuff with technology too. And um, you know, I'm. I'm always a fan of more rear-wheel drive cars on the road, so I think it's yeah. good. <laughs> we tend to like those here around, around the road Absolutely. show camp. Uh, we can take a look here. We do have a shot of just one recent car Kia has brought out that may, may, may be in this direction. This is the Kia Novo, uh, and you can get an idea that it's got a little different face that, boy, is really 3 Series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, it's a four-door, but it's got a very sporty, tidy, almost coupe-like uh, rear roof line. This is a concept car, and it's not necessarily what they're going to bring out. But it just shows they've been showing design concepts that are not what you think of in terms of economy or utilitarian vehicles that you might think of. Great-looking car. When you think about Kia. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think uh, we're going to take a, a little break here and uh, come right back. We're going to tell you what's going on with uh, new cars from Chevy, uh, Camaro on one end, Trax on the other. And get some of the latest stuff that's just about to come out right now on Roadshow. Uh, Tim's going to update us on that when Autocomplete continues. Back to Autocomplete, Episode 5. This is our February 12th, 2016 edition. Brian Cooley with Tim Stevens continuing on. Let's break down now to get an update from Tim about what's new at Roadshow. Right, so this week we have posted our new episode of Rivals, which is our big three-way segment showdown, effectively. This time we went with uh, compact SUVs, or even subcompact SUVs. Mazda CX-3 versus the Honda HRV versus the Jeep Renegade. Uh, we had a lot of fun putting those three through their paces. They're all, you know, very similar cars. They're the sorts of cars that people would really be logically cross-shopping. That's kind of the idea behind that series. But ultimately, they had very different performance. The Mazda was really great on-road. The Jeep was very great off-road. And the Honda was pretty boring overall but ultimately it was an incredibly practical car uh, i won't spoil the result but if you're thinking of, of buying something in that segment or if you're interested in that segment at all i uh, highly recommend you check that out uh we've got the chicago auto show that should be going on right now if you're watching this on on friday um a lot of great news coming out of there and uh, it's kind of a, a pre a preview of the chicago and a little bit of fun uh we sent uh, our team out to drive the nissan winter warrior concepts which is basically they took a rogue and a couple of other nissan suvs put uh, tracks on them, tank treads, basically, and they went cruising around a local ski mountain in Chicago. Um, so I'm very jealous. John Wong got to go have some fun in that thing. Uh, it sounded, looked like a lot of fun. So we got a video of that up. We also have Antoine's review of the new Scion IA. Scion is going away, but ultimately Mazda decided not to bring the Mazda 2 to the U.S. So Scion picked it up and threw a uh, Scion badge in the front, and we've got the IA. Uh, it's a great car. Uh, again, it's kind of the, the, the end of the Scion brand, as it were, but uh, but it's a great car. So and if I recall correctly, that. that carries over to a Toyota at right. the end of Scion on after this uh, model year. Right, and I don't know that they've identified exactly what which uh, model that will be, but uh, it's good that that is going to continue on perhaps yeah. the, the Toyota IA. But it's a good car, full review with video from Antoine. Uh, it's on the site right now. Good. Okay, great stuff. Waiting for your Roadshow, and that's theroadshow.com. I know a lot of you are probably still new to the site. We've only been up and running since uh, basically top of the year. So uh, whether you found us there or found us somewhere else on YouTube or elsewhere, make sure you check out the Roadshow. It's theroadshow.com, the new automotive site from CNET. Now, speaking of Chicago Auto Show, which Tim just mentioned as we're deploying our team there, one of the more interesting car stories coming out of there is a Camaro Option Package 1LE, which is a very cool hot rod package, but now being available on the V6 of the Camaro starting with 2017 model Mm -hmm. year. And 1LE adds a lot of good stuff. It gives you a 355 horsepower V6, uh, the FE3 suspension package, which comes from the SS model, uh, wider, bigger, staggered wheels, with Eagle F1s on them, four-pot Brembos, and a track cooling pack, uh, which is pretty hot stuff for a V6 Camaro that I imagine is going to be relatively affordable. Absolutely. Previously, we've only seen the 1LE on the V8, as you mentioned, uh, but in their testing, they found that the new V6 1LE is actually as quick as the outgoing V8 model around, I think it was Button Wheel they were doing the testing on, which is pretty good news. And the new V8 model is three seconds faster than the outgoing 1LE. which Just is stepping Camaro, everything up. Which is great. So if you go with the V6, you don't get the, the big brakes. You, you get bigger brakes, but not as big as not on the V8. Um, the suspension is, is, 
upgrade over the, the base Camaro, but it's not as you don't get the full um, uh, mag ride suspension that you get on the V8. Yeah, V8 gets 455, so you got another 100 mm-hmm. horse mag mm-hmm. ride. Uh, you get electronic limited slip, mm-hmm. six pot Brembos. I think the Recaros are standard. And the Recaro seats as well, which you don't get on the, the, the V6. So the V6, I'm sure, will be a, a little bit lighter, probably a, a little bit more nimble. It should be That's what maybe me. a little bit more of a, a track toy. Yeah. It, it sounds kind of like the difference between the Turbo V6, uh, or the Turbo Mustang now, and the V8 Mustang. That They're both said to be performance-oriented, but this is a different way to go, I think, as well. But again, three seconds quicker on the new V8, and the same speed from the V6 as the outgoing V8 is uh, is pretty impressive. The 1LE is a, it's definitely a track monster. It's a very very focused car. Uh, it's a great car. I can't wait to drive uh, both of them. Actually, I'm, I think sounds, it'll be fun to bring. It sounds really interesting in a V6 package. I'm always, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a V6 underdog fan. I oh, just yeah. uh, mm-hmm. I, I often find the V6 of a V6 V8 sibling set mm-hmm. to be just just right. Yep. Yep. And this could be a nice, this could be a sweet package. Mm-hmm. On the other end of Chevy's lineup, the Chevy Trax, which has turned out to be. Um, not even a sleeper hit. It's been it's become a really solid selling car for them, one that we have a lot of respect for. Uh, we've got a new version of the tracks coming to Chicago, but it's not a complete new generation, but it's nicely upgraded. Uh, with one of the more interesting parts of it is that it's got really great looking cabin upgrades, including Android Auto, CarPlay, 4G LTE, which is going wall to wall at General Motors. Um, a lot of good passive driver assists. The tracks is going to be a seriously well. Um, contented car as they say in the biz right and, and this new uh, change is not a major evolution of, of the car from a driving dynamic standpoint or, or anything else ultimately we're seeing a technology injection in this car to bring a little bit more modern uh, android auto and carplay on board now standard feature w- w- which is great a lot of new um kind of like bolt right kind of like the bolt a lot of new safety features as you mentioned and ultimately yeah this is this is i think a bit of an underdog in this category just because it's it is fairly new to the u.s uh, but it's definitely gaining a lot of ground, uh, and it I think it looks quite nice too. So hopefully this this a little bit of a tech injection will help it uh, sell a little bit more. Yeah, because it was a little Spartan inside. A lot of folks got inside. Okay, this is like you know it's almost like one of those one of those single mono gauge cars. <laughs> Everything's be- embedded in a speedo. It takes yep. you back to an old Fiat 500. Right. Uh-huh. That's never a good that's never a good language. Mm-hmm. It says oh, okay, I ran as cheap as I could. But this car actually is looking very nice. We have some great photos of the new cabin uh, over at Roadshow that you can find there. Uh, Ferrari's FF has always been the family Ferrari. Uh, uh, it's also, uh, you know, it's not the Ferrari you think of normally with its sort of coupe two plus two seating mm-hmm. for the kids lineup, but they meant it to uh, take over what used to be the 456, which is your family Ferrari. Uh, they've just basically done one major change. They've changed the name, and I'm a little pissed <laughs> off because they're taking the most vaunted name in Ferrari history and attaching it to this car. Not that the FF's not mm-hmm. a lovely car, mm-hmm. but it's now going to be called a mouthful. The GTC Four Luso. Yeah, with no 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 space, no space, no capitals. Right. Somebody needs to get the Ferrari branding people a new keyboard because we saw the same thing with the F12 Berlinetta. But then we just everybody just called the F12 Berlinetta the F12. Um, but it's obviously that this is is a pattern that Ferrari is establishing going forward. And ultimately, you know, these I think we're past the the lowercase i days. We need to get to the point where Ferrari has some proper names in there. And yeah, so GTC. Four was a two plus two coupe in the seventies, and then you're, the the Lusso was the, the, a special edition of the two fifty GT in the sixties, which was a, a more luxury Lusso means luxury in Italian. So this is ultimately them trying to take that a little bit more of a Ferrari heritage and try to apply that to the FF, which I think was definitely something that a lot of people thought was lacking with the FF. You know, this isn't a traditional Ferrari in a lot of ways because yeah. it's a hatchback uh, and it's an all wheel drive all-wheel car, drive. which is very different thing than your average Ferrari. And so a, a lot of people had a hard time seeing this car as a Ferrari, but ultimately I don't think putting a silly name on it is going to in any way pull in that Ferrari heritage. Uh, I think it's a great car. I've driven it. I, I loved it. I think it's, it's one of my favorite yeah. Ferraris, actually. Um, if I were buying a Ferrari, honestly, that would be one that I would consider because you can drive it four seasons, um, have a lot of fun with it. It's yeah. practicality. You can and I actually like the look. I love that I sort too. of, you know, that sort of shooting brake uh, look. Yeah. As interpreted by a Ferrari, mm-hmm. it's the hottest shooting brake ever put on the road. Absolutely. It's a gorgeous car. And uh, I don't, honestly, I don't know that I'm a fan of all the tweaks. So they basically added more grills to the front. They've, they've added this weird sort of, um, uh, Andrew Crock on our team said it looks like a unibrow on the rear end. Uh, it's 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 That's not good. <laughs> not the most flattering look, and the name of course is a little bit problematic. I think yeah. so. Um, not exactly a warm reception to the new GT. C4 Lusso. Lusso. And I'm going to be calling it the GT4C Lusso a lot, probably. <laughs> um, but anyhow. Um, so if you hear about that Ferrari, there's not a new Ferrari on the market. Correct. It's the FF basically it's revised it's slightly a, a and mid- taking the vaunted Lusso yes, moniker absolutely. and adding it to it and leaving out 
caps. And, well, no, they're, they're, it's, it's got caps. There's no spaces. Right. That's all. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is an odd one. U.S. traffic deaths are actually um, looking like they went up quite a bit in 2015. And that's a big story because they've been going down for a number of years. Certainly in the big train, if you look at de- decades, mm-hmm. we've been pushing deaths down for a long, long time. And all of a sudden, it looks as though there was a pretty good spike in the first nine months of 2015. We don't have Q4 in yet, so it's a three-quarter story. Basically, we went from 1.05 deaths per 100 million miles, which sounds very small, and I guess it is, to 1.10 deaths. It's actually a pretty significant bump of 5%, uh, greater than the miles driven increase last year, which has been a half percent. So accidents per mile are increasing more than miles driven, uh, something we haven't seen happen around the U.S. for a while. And, you know, I think a lot of the causes that, that you know, there's been no word on this yet specifically, but mm-hmm. it's going to come out to be, uh, you know, aside, when you factor out more miles driven, still drunk driving mm-hmm. and speeding, and these same old human foibles right. uh, from what the early expectations are, which, again, opens the door to technology mm-hmm. that can catch us in more of these situations, especially right. a, a forward collision braking, a lane management. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone's weaving, lane mm-hmm. management might be just enough to prevent one of those kissing collisions on right. the freeway where someone spins. Right. And I think we have to look at distracted driving as a major factor here as well. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really unfortunate, but ultimately that's, you know, that's one thing that I definitely see – Increasing a lot on the roads. I see a lot more people texting on the. See, on I find this one interesting. I, it's anecdotally, it mm-hmm. seems like it's going on everywhere. Mm-hmm. I think the preponderance of studies I've looked at find it's relatively small mm-hmm. in terms of being something you can actually link mm-hmm. to uh, fatality rates. Mm-hmm. And yet, you're right. You look around and you see it everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I find a weird disconnect there. It, it's definitely disconcerting um, this trend. Uh, but again, I think this is the kind of thing that we, we've seen so many studies about how s- simple um, collision warning alerts and things like that have a major impact on, on reducing collisions in cars. And uh, we were talking, I think, two weeks ago about how uh, programs to ultimately get more of those cars in the hands of people. And I think that as those safety features right. roll on into more and more cars and lower in the market, um, that that's going to have a huge impact. And, and I hope that you know we are at uh, some sort of peak here and that things just go straight down from here. I think the next breakthrough is absolutely going to be technology-driven. We've mm-hmm. already had the you know that and the other one, like you say, would be stigmatizing distraction, which still has not hit its mad moment where it becomes like smoking or drunk driving. It just is, we all get past it and immediately right. start to decry it. Mm-hmm. It's still kind of in a gray zone where too many people think, oh, it's okay. It's not at all like drunk driving. Well, it probably is. Or worse, depending on what survey you look at, it actually can be more uh, demeaning to your driving skill than having had a couple cocktails. So it needs to hit that stigmatization level. But beyond that one, it's just technology's got to step in. We ha- we need the next crop of stability control and airbags and anti-lock brakes to join us. Right, and they, they just need to get pushed further and further down the market, and which with yes. which they are. So um, having those in, in more affordable trend. cars that'll be that'll be great, and we're seeing that this year. Now you may have heard a story that the EPA is about to outlaw you taking any car made for the street and ever using it on the track on emissions grounds. The story's been going around, and it's. It's more nuanced than that. That's, that's a little shrill. <laughs> Turns out it's not the case that they're going to do that. Turns out it's technically the case they've already done that. But the enforcement mm. is not one they've ever taken terribly seriously. So we dug into this. It came originally from an organization called SEMA, the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association, which is a trade group of people that are doing you know, tires, wheels, body mm-hmm. kits, exhausts, uh, add-on hot rod gear for your engine. That's the aftermarket world, and SEMA is their trade group. Great bunch of companies do some really cool stuff. They have a great trade show in Vegas every year. We cover it. But they are very, very pro their business and can be a little – shrill in their pronouncements when you dig more into this it turns out the epa has had a rule that was adopted in i believe 2015 taking effect fully by 2018 and that says yeah technically speaking Mm -hmm. you cannot buy a car on the showroom uh, as i understand it Mm -hmm. with the intent of making it a competition car and removing emission controls along the way right so you Basically, th- that would mean that the same laws that apply to the emission systems on a car now, removing catalytic converters and things like that, would apply on the track as well or any other off-road use as far as I can tell. So basically, you know, the idea of a street-only or track-only exhaust package you see a lot of manufacturers selling at this point yeah. would be illegal, effectively. Um, and your installation of that thing would also be illegal. Um, that is currently the case for on-road cars. That was actually news to me that this was also the case for cars that are specifically used off-road. Um, yeah. But... Uh, 
that's that's a little bit disconcerting. Right now, it sounds like this would be not retroactive to any car before 2015. That's uh, right. Which is which is somewhat good news if you're out there doing Miata Cup racing. And that I kind of don't thing. believe they <laughs> really older go after these cars. I mean, right. I've never seen EPA show up at a track event. Right. But it, it doesn't mean that you cannot take your car and turn it into a track car. You just need to leave the stock exhaust effectively in oh, place. Or, or anything <laughs> yeah. Hit the track with your the catalytic inverter. Yeah. Is, which, honestly, <laughs> given noise regulations at a lot of tracks these days, that, that oh. may not be the end of the world anyway because we're seeing more and more bigger mufflers appearing on race cars yeah, to get true. by uh, regulations. So, you know, maybe that's not the end of the world. But ultimately, this doesn't mean that the, the idea of a track toy is going away. You'll still be able to buy your car and cage it and rip out the interior and do everything else that you want All to. All that non-emissions Right, stuff. but you'll have yeah. to have an, uh, basically an EPA legal exhaust system on the car. Technically so. speaking. Technically speaking. Again, the enforcement on this, I think, is going to be pretty low priority for them. Right. And it, I mean, yeah, it, it depends how they want to do it. You could see something as draconian as some sort of a, an inspection system where basically, you know, you have to have a sticker on the dashboard that says that this car has been inspected, that the exhaust is is, is inspected, and, and then organizations like um, NASA and, and others would have but to But also other components, so, you know, on top, chipping, injection systems, oh, yeah. those are yeah. all EPA, uh, you know, regulated. Mm-hmm. So they could really get into your powertrain if they wanted to. I think one of the mm-hmm. big dividers would be, is this car registered for street use or not? Right. If yeah. it's not, they're not going to care. Right. I can't imagine. I would hope not. But if you're taking a street <laughs> registered car with, ag- right. with, with, with valid tags mm-hmm. on it and you're tracking it because you got a serious build on it, mm-hmm. but it, you know, it's, it's legal enough to drive back and forth, mm-hmm. that's when you could be in technically uh, legal hot water as we read right. this. And the fines on this are pretty big, up to and including, I think, basically taking the car. Oh, don't screw with EPA. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> you do not want to get in trouble. These are the super fun people. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's it, it is you know there was a lot of um, fear and certainty and doubt this week on Twitter from this. Yeah. Uh, it remains to be seen exactly what uh, the implementation. It's, was. Yeah, it, it sounds like it's about half as bad as you've probably heard if you've right. heard the worst case. But we'll keep an eye on that as more uh, nuance comes out. A couple quick ones here. Uh, if you go to a, buy a Jeep in the near future, you may find that uh, they try to sell you a better stereo. Nothing unusual about that. But it may not be a Jeep stereo. It may be an Alpine rig. This is a new trend in the business as the as the aftermarket uh, electronics biz is, you know, not in its best days these days. Most people stick with their factory audio system. Uh, we'll take a look here at a new system. If we go to my screen, you can see something called Alpine Restyle. It's a new line that they are selling in new car dealers, not just in the aftermarket. So the first dealers to get this are Jeep. And you can take a look at what a, what a Restyle looks like. So here's the Jeep rig. Uh, apparently only available right now for Wrangler. You go buy a new Wrangler, and let's say it's a two-door, uh, and you choose the factory system like this that you want to make better. And here's what a restyle system would look with. It's a completely different fascia, much bigger screen. It often includes new um, sort of uh, plastics and bezels around climate control if necessary, uh, even including some of the HVAC switch gear to get it all to work right. So as you can see, that's a completely different look. It's a heavy-duty update, but being sold at showrooms is something unusual. And, of course, the reason that they uh, like this at the dealership is the, uh, the margins are fat. Yeah. And these systems are seven to $8,000, mm-hmm. uh, according to a story uh, that we were looking at in a sort of average ticket. That's mm-hmm. a lot of money. And you can, of course, roll that into your loan. So, you know, you're only right. looking at maybe, you know, 10 or $20 extra a month. Yep. And, for the, a the, killer the sound system. <laughs> and so a lot of people are going to go for it. And you have that, you know, the, the peace of mind knowing that it's going to be installed correctly. It'll be in your car. And if you have a problem, they can take it back to the dealership. Okay, so should, I think yeah, it should be warranted. Right. So that'll be something that yeah. I think will be a very popular thing for a lot of the new car buyers. I like that. A uh, story from the Center for Automotive Research. You know, we talk a lot about lightweighting around here from the new Ford GT to what they're doing with, uh, you know, the LaFerrari. I mean, all kinds of, but even getting down to the BMW 7 with carbon core uh, structure. Mm. Lightweighting is big for any kind of car. It makes just about everything better on a car. Mm-hmm. But the story from Center of Automotive Research says, yeah, here's the problem with lightweighting. It's not the idea that we can't get the body shell or something lighter and all that hardware. If we take a look at this chart that we've got here, uh, we'll just make this simple for you. The, the bottom band in blue, here's the overall trend in cars. You see they're getting heavier. The overall arc is going up. Not as heavy as they were, but going up. But if you take a look at the bottom band in blue, that's the body, the basic body, base shell, chassis, and basic uh, powertrain. That's gone down. Uh, for the most part, trended mm-hmm. up recently. Emissions gear hasn't been adding a lot to the pie. Neither has safety gear. It's been pretty stable for a number of years, but the top band, the purple band, which is getting fatter and being significantly more part of the car, that's where the weight gain keeps going up, and that's comfort and convenience. Additional tech, yeah. 
more padding, more mm-hmm. sound deadening, mm-hmm. more sensors and radar and displays and HUD apparatus. So 30-way power seats. Yep, 30-way power <laughs> seats. Just the switches for those right. add 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. So all that, all those cool little doohickeys you love in your car, all the tech that we do love, mm-hmm. and all that comfort and convenience and four-zone AC and separate uh, uh, champagne chillers in the back seat looking at you Bentley owners, um, you're killing the lightweighting trend. Mm-hmm. I mean, just realize that. And safety as well, of course, has a big impact there. And some of the emission stuff helped as well. But yeah, absolutely, it's comfort and convenience to having a big impact. Even though the cars themselves are getting lighter, yeah. um, the, the 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 framework of the car that she's is getting lighter. But uh, we are seeing innovations. BMW is doing a lot of effort to get the, the their seats lighter in, in the new i8 and i3. They're very thin carbon back seats, but ultimately yep. they're just as comfortable as their 3 Series seats, for example. So I think we'll continue to see some progress there. And a lot of the uh, a lot of the things we see forward looking from the companies that make interiors for car makers are showing this is really really a big one thinner and thinner seats. I can't tell how much yeah, weight is right. in your seats. Yeah. The padding, the frame, the frames are still mm-hmm. still typically steel. Some cars use lighter aluminum or even magnesium frames. For the most part, though, take a seat out of your car one day, you'll throw your back out. I mean, they're heavy. They got motors bolted up under them. Mm-hmm. Uh, seats are an amazingly big part of addressable weight gain. Last story we have for uh, for you this week is a follow-up on last week. We told you how Tata, the big Indian car maker, has a car in their hands called the Zika. Whoops. For them, it means zippy car. But of course, for everyone around the world right now, it tends to mean something more along the lines of a virus. So what we've got now at the uh, Delhi Auto Show, which I believe is going on right now as we do our show live today on the 11th, is uh, they, they've got a naming contest. So if you're interested in helping them name the Zika, <laughs> Uh, if you can go to their Facebook page for uh, the Tata Zika, and it uh, looks like this. you got to scroll down, as of today anyway, about uh, four or five, maybe six entries. Anyway, you'll find it down there. Here it is, the Zika name hunt. So they're looking to uh, get someone's idea what to name this, even though it has gone to market as the Zika because they couldn't pull the name fast enough right. right as this virus broke out. But anyway, if you're interested in helping them with uh, with that one, if you're especially if you're in our uh, our, our Indian market, and I want to uh, say thanks to uh, Mahesh Y, who is an automotive journalist in the subcontinent and uh, turned us on to that. He was our eyes on the ground at the Delhi Auto Show a couple days ago to say that, yes, it did go out of Zika and with kind of a big asterisk at the booth saying, but we were not going to stay with that name. <laughs> so thank you, Mahesh, for uh, for working the floor for us there. Okay, uh, that's Auto Complete, Episode 5 for February 12th. Don't forget, stay on top of everything about automobile at Roadshow. at theroadshow.com from CNET. With Tim Stevens, I'm Brian Cooley. We'll talk to you next week.